yourself and say, look, what are you doing? Where are you? And, and all the rest of that. I, how have you done? No, no, in terms of you know, being able to contact them directly and get that kind of information. Uh, ben Eastland, on the other hand, has maintained a dialogue uh, you know, with me, and we continue that dialogue. And in fact, I'm, I'm hoping that you know, as time goes on, we'll be able to you know, talk a little bit more about some of the things that are coming out of, out of his own papers. What do you suppose uh, the, the chances are of getting uh, Eastland on the radio? You know, this would be interesting. Uh, you know, he actually, uh, we, we've been kind of talking about that recently because there are some things, you know, his secrecy agreements with our co-expired a few years back, and he's got, you know, a fair amount of information that's kind of interesting and compelling on the subject. Why don't you yeah. ask him uh, if he'd be willing to come on the program with you? Well, we'll do it. You know, I think that would be fun. And I, and actually, I think he, oh. he just might take us up on that offer. It'll be the first time we've We've really done that. You know, we recently did a piece, you know, Harp does this annual kind of dog and pony show open house here. Yes. So uh, APRN, the public radio affiliate here in Alaska, actually did a segment with Ben and I. And afterwards, you know, we started talking about the possibility of maybe collaborating and taking the rest of his information and getting it out in some fashion. And radio was part of that discussion. So I'll, I'll have that pursue that more seriously. Maybe we get some Please do. I would yeah, absolutely, absolutely love to do uh, that program. It will be a lot of fun, actually. And I, I'm, I, I just think he just might be in, inclined to do it. So I'll make contact with him and see what we can arrange. What percentage of what he knows would you guess he'd be able to talk about? Uh, quite a bit, actually, uh, you know, because his agreements were corporate agreements which had expirations. And, you know, I mean, the things that he did with uh, military projects, he certainly can't get into. And Ben Eastland, Dr. Eastland, has a you know, b big background in working in military projects going back you know, to Department of Energy days in the 1950s. So he's been around a long time, but I know he's been working on some applications in the area of weather modification that he thinks are interesting and things that... Can you tell us anything? I, I mean, obviously, he's told you something, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, yeah. His, you know, the big concerns are, I can tell you, is from my conversations with him and then and with others, is that as they get up to the energy levels they're now starting to delve into, uh, you know, <laughs> you can really create some pretty dramatic uh, effects. And, you know, the concern he has also is, you know, his work was done 20 years ago in, in antenna design and efficiency and software design and efficiency and all of that has changed you know dramatically since then so when you you know kind of couple all this together uh, what has he specifically told you about weather modification that it's you know that certainly is possible absolutely that possible, it's possible with these kind of systems you know in terms of katrina he and i've had that discussion and oh i would agree with him that to create this with harp is probably unlikely affecting it in some different ways um, is highly probable or possible, uh, but you know, again, creating it because of the energy amount involved in Katrina is so huge, and just what what he knows of the physics of HARP, it would be difficult to see how that could how that could happen at this stage of the game. But having said that, you know, being able to affect its energy density or affect other systems that might impact it, that's a whole other matter, and I think that's where uh, we could have some pretty interesting discussions. Again, though, you would imagine that he would be perhaps privy uh, in at least a general way in the way this uh, the technology is being applied right now. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. not uh, all of it could be talked about. I'd almost be willing to bet. Right. But he's, you know, he's been out of a lot of those projects where, you know, he can pretty much, you know, based on his own experience within programs, or, you know, he may not be able to comment on those, but you can pretty well predict the state of the technology based on what's happening in your field and, you know, Ben Eastland's no slouch, so... Uh, exactly. You know, he's um, a, a very good physicist, and, uh, and and I think he's got a lot of integrity. You know, over the years, as we've gotten to know Dr. Eastland, you know, he was interested in this project for all, all of the right reasons as a scientist and inventor. Uh, the, the problem has become, and I think, and he would be the first to say it, and, and he does, in fact, say it many of his papers since, is, is the lack of um, generalists, or at least... Um, sort of the overview uh, view of science is everyone's so specialized that no one really considers uh, perhaps the implications of their own science against what else it might be doing. And that's the case of these high energy systems used for uh, all of the applications that are being contemplated right now. Well, and, that, and that's where electrophysiologists and others need to Even though we, we don't know, Doctor, I, I can honestly tell you that uh, a lot of ham operators out there are going, what the hell is going on? They really are with right. uh, with communications. It's that bad. That's the ionosphere. So right. 
Right. Something and, weird and bad is happening. Then we look at the weather, we look at the viruses, and you begin to put the whole picture together uh, along with global warming. Uh, right. For example, doctor, um, if you look south to the calving icebergs and look north right. to the lack of ice... Yeah, and and look at the last forty or fifty years of right. uh, of polar region change, and I've watched it personally. Uh, yes, uh, it's startling. Yeah, and it actually goes back even further. You know, the problem is uh, these Arctic regions haven't been populated so widely, and things track for very long periods of time, at least in this part of the world and and in northern Siberia and so on. But when you look at sort of what happens, you know, with with the you know Arctic ice sort of pulling back creates larger areas of open water that then retain heat more efficiently, that then cause permafrost to melt on land, that then cause, you know, methane gas and other greenhouse gases to be released, which then accelerate the whole cycle. Yes. And we, we're experiencing that here, and it's been going on quite a long time. If you go back, I mean, the area I'm standing in, right where I'm standing, uh, less than uh, a couple thousand years ago, were uh, many thousands of feet of ice above my head. <laughs> I mean, that's... You know, that's not very long ago in geologic uh, uh, time. And when you look at, you know, what's happening in the Arctic regions, it's the, literally the uh, canary in the cave uh, because things are amplified in the Arctic and the uh, Antarctic, and that's where you're seeing the big effects of uh, whatever's going on in, in climate change. And I, well, I Doctor, the last time I was in your area, last time yeah. I was in Alaska, um, uh, the tour guide was just um, saying some amazing things. This is years ago now. Right. And they, they were saying the permafrost is melting right. in, in your state, and trees are starting to die, and weird right. things are beginning to happen because of all these changes going on in Alaska. And, of course, right. you're kind of like on the edge there between the real cold stuff up north and, and here. So you're kind of in that area that's going to be most affected by a minor change, right? Right, exactly right. And the ocean temperatures here, in, in, in not in the El Nino cycles, but in the opposite periods, have actually increased in temperature in some years by 5 to 15 degrees, which is, you know, when you talk about ocean temperature changes, they start getting real concerned when you talk about one degree change on the average. But the averages are over the whole planet. The polar regions are where those averages are amplified. And so, you know, that's a huge change in terms of what happens here. And then as, a, you know, as the oceans are the engine for weather and jet stream flows, all of that then gets affected. And so, you know, you, you've got other factors that aren't even considered. So, you know, we wrote some years ago back in the late 90s the uh, proposal that perhaps some of the uh, problems with the El Nino and the climate change cycle were, di were directly related to undersea venting in volcanics, you know, because most of the world is covered by the oceans and they've mapped in the South Pacific alone, you know, to, I believe it's now 1,200 volcanoes that exist under the seas. And so, you know, energy that gets released in that way is retained. 100% is absorbed into the ocean. You know, try and heat something from the surface, you know, with, with uh, uh, a flashlight. You know, <laughs> I mean, the temperatures of the oceans um, are such that they're stratified based on temperature so the warmer areas stay close to the Surface. Doctor, the natives of your state, how, how are they being affected by these? These are pretty radical dramatic. changes in your area. So, so what's going on with the natives in Alaska? Um, how's it dramatically, you say? Yeah, we have like 60 coastal communities that are disappearing. We have one area where one of the elders recently was quoted as remembering in, in the last 30 years where he had about three to four miles of marshland and lakes between him and the ocean, and now he has a few feet to his door. You know, and these Really? This area, because of the extreme changes in climate and the opening of the oceans, really have created some pretty profound changes. When you look at the Arctic uh, slope, they've taken images from um, high-flying aircraft and satellite images for decades, and comparing those images show changes in the vegetation footprint. We have bees on the North Slope. There's no um, word for that uh, uh, kind of insect up there you know, in the native huh. tongues. Because they didn't exist, you know. I mean, we've had and are having a significant change in climate in Alaska that will have and is already having a profound effect on the rest of the planet, along well, with all of the Arctic regions. Well, here's the thing, uh, Doctor. If, if I were, let's say, President of the United States or some other powerful country, and I observed what was going on globally, I would be, no doubt, concerned. And I would turn to my advisors and say, look... It's like UFOs. It's a, to your advisors, look, do we have the ability to 
control or change what appears to be a terrible situation bearing down on the planet on which we live. So yep. can we do anything about it? Is there anything, any way to affect what seems to be happening? I would ask my advisors. Now, I'm yep. sure that's happened, Doctor. Yep, absolutely. HARP would be one of the areas they might l look. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, when you start looking at, you know, what are the contingencies? The military is charged to plan for kind of every contingency uh, that might create insecurity within the country. And certainly, you know, climate change, I think, is the biggest security issue on the planet right Real now. Real high on the list. Yeah, I mean, because it's, you're jeopardizing food security and production security when, you know, you can debate till the cows come home, and they will uh, debate <laughs> Uh, whether it's man's fault or nature's fault, but that debate should be laid aside and recognize the change is here, and it's not reversing. And we've been saying it for well over a decade. You know, Amen on that one. They've got to stop arguing about what it is, doing it, and and begin reacting to reality. And yeah, yeah. This and obviously is underway. There's a very serious change underway. Yeah, absolutely. And when you start looking at all of that, it's not really a time for you know, closed uh, to the public experimentation with the very systems that are driving um, what is happening. And, you know, here's the thing. These things don't reverse like overnight. You know, this uh, cycle is a cycle that even if, if, if you assume that man was fully responsible and you shut everything down today, you, you've got a uh, hundred years to wait to catch up. But, Doctor, you can't talk on. about it. If, if you so much as officially discuss the possibility of weather control and manipulation, then people immediately begin to think that you, well, are eliminating. And we've had such a bad time of it. The liability would be so astronomical, the potential yep. liability. Yep. People sue things for any, other, oh, other yeah. people for anything these days. So the, the liability would be so astounding, you could never, ever say a word about it. Never. Right. And, 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 it, and you have to look at this as... Um you know, doing this uh, kind of activity, if it may have this downstream effect you don't ex expect, you may solve, say, your own crop failure problem one year and cause somebody else to, to, fit, to crops to fail. Uh. You know, if that was us on the other end of that equation, we'd consider that a, a, an act of war, I'm sure. Um, or I'm sure we would. You know, and that's, again, where you start to look at, you know, we, we may get a certain advantage for ourselves but create a huge problem for someone else I, I don't think that's the answer I think you know really when you start looking at it the recognition of the, the these are periodic shifts for whatever reason um, you know I mean 4,000 years ago for goodness sake the last mastodon left Alaska you know that's not very long ago no it isn't and you know we we've seen climate change results and profound implications um, historically but I think it's more complex than what we're seeing. And well, Doctor, I, I, look, human beings, uh, you said it yourself, you know, we, we're used to thinking in terms of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of years uh, for these changes to occur. But in our lifetimes, right. it seems as though we're seeing many more profound yes. changes than we should ever see in a human lifetime. Yeah, and This has got to mean something big. Yeah, exactly right. And that's exactly the point is, you know, this, the curve on all of these areas, you know, if you look at all the kinds of s signals, whether it's shifts in the magnetic pole accelerating or whether it's earthquake or storm intensity increasing or whether it's any right. of these energy releases, they're all got right. the same sharp spike on the curve. And that's where you go, wait a minute, you know, how much more, you know, can this planet take and what are we adding into it? Yeah, how much more? Disrupt it? And then you add on to that these viruses, emerging viruses right. that, that we have, and it, it kind of forms a totality of a picture, if you want to put it all together. Maybe it's wrong to put it all together, but it's almost irresistible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The um, outer wall of the hurricanes now passing uh, through Key West. So just an incredible night um, at the end of an incredible hurricane season. And so I think it's a natural thing that people are going to wonder about the kinds of things that we're talking about tonight, Dr. Begich. Uh, Mike in Auburn, Washington, pr pretty far out question, uh, says controlling our sun certainly would control the weather, wouldn't it? Um, ask Dr. Begich. He knows anything about ex any experiments to try and control solar weather cycles. That's solar weather cycles, which, of course, ultimately would control the weather on Earth. 
it might be one way to curb global warming or i suppose uh, exacerbate it uh, doctor no i don't i don't think so I, you know th- th- that's that's just uh, I think not in the realm of possibilities uh, that I know of anyway. Uh, you know, right. the, 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 the idea of affecting the ionosphere is sort of affecting this, you know, the secondary component of that, because that's what, you know, we, we see that disturbance, then we see the consequences of it. If we can manipulate that, which is what systems like CARP are about, uh, th- then that becomes a much different, different game. You know, when you were talking before the break about the interference with radio uh, ham operators, you remember the woodpecker signal back in the 70s? Uh, vividly. Yeah, and you know this is um, uh, not the same problem, but the same result, and it, and that was attributed to the old uh, ionosphere heaters that existed in the former Soviet Union back in the 70s, which are the precursors to the current HARP system. The HARP system is just more powerful, more versatile, uh, and capable. You know, based on you know decades of, of uh, science advancements in the areas that affect this this, this area entirely. Well, if I could get my hands on the person controlling the ionosphere right now, if in fact they are, I'd like to, well, I'd not be happy with them. Well, you know, here's a, there was a paper, you know, when we were debating, uh, we were supposed to be actually debating NATO in the European Parliament in February of 98, and they, they wouldn't show up on the uh, story was that, you know, they didn't have any uh, interest in ionospheric modification for any sort of weapons uses. And so we opened that hearing, actually, with a document called Ionospheric Modification for Weapons Applications Mm. by NATO France. (laughs) That was an unclassified uh, document, you know, and that went back to the mid uh, and early 90s, you know, when that kind of discussion was happening within NATO. And and when you start to look at how important uh, the ionosphere is to military systems, and if you start to think about military systems becoming highly vulnerable, the more they depend and become technologically dependent, you know, more the finer the circuits, the more easily disrupted by uh, energy as a weapon in and of itself. So when you start to think about uh, energy as a concept, the way it's being embraced by military today, it's what they call the the revolution in military affairs, or RMA, which is this concept of getting away from the bullets and the bombs of the past and talking about manipulating energetic systems in ways that are perhaps even more devastating um, but maybe more precisionly uh, controlled. So they actually refer to this whole area as controlled effects, which shows up in a June 2004 issue of Technology Horizons by the Air Force. It's uh, something put together by their, their Directed Energy Directorate, which deals with this whole area of manipulating um, uh, environmental systems, hardware, software, and, in fact, human beings. And when you start to look at the whole s- scale of where this technology is headed, of which HARP is but a small part, and maybe a metaphor, you know, because of all the coverage it's gotten over the years for this entire advancement that's taking place in military science that's, that's quite risky at this point in time. Um, one application of HARP has always been speculated to be some kind of mind control or some right. kind of control of human beings. Right, and this goes back to, uh, again, uh, references by Brzezinski in Between Two Ages, the book he wrote uh, while at Columbia University, and, and he was referring to J.F. Gordon McDonald's work, who was a geophysicist at UCLA, who was a science advisor, incidentally, to President Johnson, and what he was suggesting is that if we could ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere in just the right way, we could return a signal to the Earth that would manipulate the behavior of human beings, of human beings over large geographic areas. And so... Then you take that and you kind of look at, say, the work of Jose Delgado at Yale University, and, and he started by mapping the brain. And by the mid-'80s, he was using uh, radio frequency signals at one-fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces, very mm-hmm. small energy concentrations, uh, well within the capability of HARP, according to the HARP planners, yes. uh, are able to manipulate the behavior and brain chemistry of humans. Like In what manner? Well, uh, taking them from, say, highly aggressive to very passive, as an example, um, by being able to affect with these external signals where the brain will actually entrain, will lock on to those external signals operating within what's called a window frequency. And these are the, where the action is. It's like um, dialing through the radio tonight to get to this uh, program. You know, people got mostly static between the stations, but when they had resonance, harmony between the transmitter and receiver, you got a nice clear signal and they got to hear our voices. Well, the same is true uh, with every single thing that exists, <laughs> you know, and particularly living organisms. And the understanding of that 
allows you then to manipulate the biochemistry of human beings or anything else if you do it intentionally. More importantly, what's happening today on the planet is accidentally because you've got these huge interactions between electromagnetic fields and chemicals that we're introducing on an increasing basis that are causing all kinds of problems. There's no shortage of wars. We're involved in one at the moment. Yeah. Um, so if we had weapons that could control minds, would we not have already been uh, using them? Or maybe a better question is, have we already used them? That, that's the better question. And, ah, and, and the okay. answer is absolutely yes. In fact, um, you know, if you go back, there was a um, report done going back to the 70s. Uh, it was a presidential report on the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, June 1976, where they actually slapped the CIA for their mind control experiments. But when you look at more recent conflicts, the first Gulf War, when all those guys were surrendering in mass. Yes. Uh, you know, there was a, 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 a Scottish press report that came out after the war, something we had speculated on, saying that the most devastating weapon was an infrasound technology where they embedded signals on the radio broadcast, broadcasting the Muslim music and prayers in a way that created fear and panic in the population. And when you look at what happened to the fourth largest army in the world, you know, it kind of makes a lot more sense than the excuses we've heard, which is bombardment, you know. But think about dumping ordnance in London or, or um, uh, any of the communities during World War II. You know, it would happen consistently at civilian populations. Well, I certainly do recall the... Um, astounding headlines that people, soldiers, were giving up in these massive, incredible, uh, right, unreasonable numbers. I mean, just giving up Bloody. like crazy. <laughs> like, you, yeah, so you like think it was used? You think it was used? Yeah, I do actually. You know, there's um, you know, the, this device that they announced some years ago, uh, this radio frequency dish that's mounted on a Humvee. Yes, and they talked about it for heating the surface of the skin and so on. You know, that's all true and plausible, but if you look at the radio frequency dosimetry handbook uh, commissioned by the United States Air Force Science Advisory Board at the University of Utah, you can find out that by tuning that, by changing its frequency, wave, form, pulse rate, or any number of perimeters, you can affect any vital organ of the body in a devastating way, causing heart attack in a crowd, for instance, or uh, manipulating the lungs, liver, kidneys, etc., and you know, that's what they don't tell you. As they introduce new technologies to the battlefield, they give you sort of the plausible story for why this thing is sitting there. But the, the use of radio frequency energy, when you look at the research, it's pretty astounding. And in all three of the books that we've written, there's over 1,350 sources cited. The DVDs we've produced have the same kind of... Now, let me ask you about the DVD. What yeah. is, uh, what's the DVD? Talk, what we, talk about that. What we did is we produced actually two of them. One is um, the one on mind control, and it, it deals with this whole topic and kind of breaks down sort of the sinister side of what's happening and how that technology evolved, but then flipping that around, talking about some of the things happening in this area from brain biofeedback to light and sound devices, you know, electroacupuncture, some of the things happening in energy science is pretty exciting, and we demonstrate a lot of that. The other one is technologies of the 21st century, which is four subjects. It deals with the updates on HARP, which people have asked for for a number of years now, and so we try to do that in a good way. Um, also, underwater sonars and their implications globally, uh, we get into that. Cell phones, we get into a bit. And then the privacy-related technology show sort of how those interconnect. and where Doctor, do you have any private individuals that have been monitoring HARP for you? I would imagine you do, and so you probably know when HARP is very active, don't you? Well, from time to time. Uh, you know, I don't work with anyone consistently, and that's been a bit of a problem in terms of getting really good uh, reports that are reliable on HARP. But... You know, what we've seen over the years, you know, the, again, they've continued to increase it. The funding continues to flow. And when you look at what they've already demonstrated to get the existing funding, uh, it's pretty amazing. And, and the implications of it, you know, aren't, there's no stretching. It's just taking their own literature and, and collating it in a way where people can see it in one place. And that's essentially what we've done on these technology areas. And I think that's, these are the most important areas, I think, for us uh, in this century, are going to be these very areas where we now have this unique capability as human beings of doing these things. And the big question is, should we? <laughs> should we be doing them? And, and who is it who is asking those questions? Well, that's the problem, because... 
You know, the Air Force budget, their equipment budget alone, about 40% of it are for black projects that even the Congress doesn't even get to know what they're putting up the money for. When you start throwing that kind of money, billions and billions into these kinds of efforts, without any oversight, yes. bureaucracies decide. And, and, and underlying government, you know, my dad was in the Congress for uh, uh, you know, a while, and he was in state politics here in Alaska for a while. And the thing about it is, Politicians come and go. Bureaucracies sort of live forever. <laughs> and, and so at one level, uh, these projects have advanced through Republican and Democratic administrations, and you, you can kind of follow the trends, and we have. And at the end uh, is this uh, very profound change. In fact, the military published a document. We have it as, on one of the CD-ROMs that goes with the DVDs, and it's a revolution of military affairs. It was written by the U.S. Army War College, and it's this document that sort of lays out how do you introduce all these technologies, you know, without people being really upset about it? You know, because a lot of them infringe on personal privacy, liberty, in a lot of different ways. Indeed. And they said, through an environment of fear, this is written back in 1989, and they said, in an environment of fear stimulated by international terrorism and international drug trafficking, Americans would, you know, forego their traditional values in favor of uh, this sense of greater security. Safety, yes. So, uh, here we are, you know, I mean... <laughs> And, you know, you think about international terrorism as a, or terrorism generally in the United States over, say, the last 15 years, and it may amount to 5,000 deaths, which is substantial, a number of Americans. And, but, but when you compare that by, but for instance, by... Uh, highway deaths. Highway deaths or medical malpractice, which killed in the same 15 years a million and a half Americans, according to Harvard. You don't see anything in the newspapers about that. Mm -hmm. But the point is... It's all proportional risk. You know, when you exist in an environment of fear, then all of a sudden certain things start going out the window. And with technology advancing as rapidly as it is, you know, it, it, cha it, it actually doubles every nine to ten months. Well, I can tell you this, Doctor. After this hurricane season, there are going to be a lot of people asking hard questions. I'm not sure that they're going to get realistic answers and real answers, but I can tell you that it's, it's been so bad that, somebody's going to be asking questions. They're going to be dissecting what's happened here and saying, you know, this is real, something very serious is, is going on, and right. maybe we'll, is there any chance we'll get any real answers? Well, you know, here's my, you know, my sense of it. You know, lately, you know, we've gotten a lot of inquiries from around the world. You know, this issue has not gone away. I think it, it, it then drives the inquiries that need to happen, and ultimately... You know, th these systems affect everyone. You know, when you start talking about being able to do these things and when you have people like the Secretary of Defense talking about it openly, that terrorists, I mean, unsophisticated governments in terms of their science are able to create these effects, I think it's time for people to be concerned. And I, and I think a lot of the work we've done over the years has been part of that sort of process of educating politicians. And How do we express that concern? Well, I think that's, you know, first getting good information in front of political leadership always is helpful, and that's been, you know, part of our work. You know, in the last year, we've uh, gotten supported in our research efforts by the Lay Foundation on Technologies, which is giving us a chance to, you know, take this a little bit further in terms of public education, and, you know, I think that's what we've really been about. You but, know, Doctor, we're... isn't this so easy to dismiss? I mean, uh, a person aff afflicted with a genuine mental illness, for example... Uh, frequently is seen to be uh, putting up aluminum foil to stop the, <laughs> right, e right. the evil beams that are sure. irradiating them. Sure. You know, I mean, that's classic stuff. Oh, and you betcha. And, and, you know, and, and that's why it's such a big hurdle to try and, you know, hop over to get political action on. But I can tell you there's a, a clause in the European Parliament's resolution, this is a comprehensive resolution on security disarmament, and it's um, their resolution A four zero 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 five forward slash ninety nine. And this is right after the sections that we were able to get on HARP. And we asked them to bring in this whole issue of non lethals, and we demonstrated huh. infrasound technology. And here's what they wrote in the resolution. Uh, it calls in section twenty seven. It calls for an international convention introducing a global ban on all developments and deployments of weapons which might enable any form of manipulation of human beings. Unquote. Huh. To get a political body to put that into this resolution, and it was the most comprehensive security and disarmament resolution, and this is but one small section of it, required a, a, a huge amount of evidence. And what we took with us was on HARP and on non-lethal systems were three feet of documents, unclassified documents that supported our positions 
over four trips to Europe at the invitation of the European Parliament, and we took a working infrasound device that literally transferred sound information <laughs> into the nervous system where you could perceive that voice in the head. And believe me, oh, really? uh, we had uh, the European Parliament's attention, and when those sections passed, they passed by the largest margins because we had a coalition of Greens, Social Democrats, and Conservatives leading off with the Conservatives. Uh, Tom Spencer at the time was chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee. Can you imagine being invited to give a similar presentation here with our political current circumstance? Well, it would be, you know, I think it would be useful. And, you know, hopefully one day... You well, know, that, perhaps that, it would be. I'm saying, though, honestly, oh, with the current political environment, can you honestly imagine... No, no, no I can't not either. Not in the U.S. You know, we had it in, in our state legislature, and then our senior senator from Alaska who's a very powerful man in Washington, decided he didn't want to see any more hearings. And ah. there was a Republican majority in the legislature, and they decided they would listen to him, and we had one hearing. And the sad part was uh, we had lined up to go to the follow-on hearing. Dr. Eason was prepared to appear. Really? Uh, and as long as ARCO would have waived at that time their privacy restrictions, he would have talked openly. And it would have put everyone on the spot about how open this project was. And you know, that follow-on hearing didn't happen, but, you know, as you said earlier, maybe we can get, get uh, Dr. Eastland on and we can have that one on the... I would be uh, wonderful to have him on the radio and uh, just sort of take hours and see if we can unwind him a little bit. He's a really good guy, you know, and he's got um, a good way of explaining, you know, the science behind his, his ideas and... You know, he's got a lot of good stuff. And he's well, then, Dr. Eastland, consider this an official invitation. I'm sure that uh, it'll be passed on to you. We would, I would love to have you on the program uh, with uh, Dr. Begich. We'll do and it. I'll get hold of him. We just spend several hours picking his mind. <laughs> it'll be fun. <laughs> it'll be fun. And actually, you know, when you start to look at, you know, where all this science goes, and, you know, when you look at sort of the interrelationships of, um, of this science, that gets pretty exciting. And at the same time, you know, that's where all of this risk starts to show up. And this is where, you know, European parliamentarians, when we demonstrated this infrasound technology, which, you know, groups like the Strategic Studies Institute in London and others have talked about, but no one ever demonstrated to a political body, believe me, it had a profound effect. All right. In just a very few moments, what we'll do is we'll invite the audience to come in. So I'm kind of plastered to CNN watching the coverage of this happen, and they've become very good at what they do in covering it. So my kudos go out to uh, CNN. Their weather guy is superb, and they've just been doing a really good job. So kudos to CNN. My guest tonight, Dr. Nick Begich, we're talking about something very much perhaps, <laughs> I have to throw that caveat in, perhaps related, and that is... Uh, the HARP facility in Alaska, and I might add elsewhere, could they be uh, in some way attempting to affect the weather? And we would hope, uh, optimistically, they would try to affect it for the, the better. Uh, if so, then it hasn't been working out too well this year so far. Back to Dr. Begich, and by the way, your questions in a moment. <laughs> is one of the sounds made by harp. Actually, we, we have quite a number here. I've, I've played these previously, uh, recorded some number of months ago now. Pretty strange stuff. All going to the ionosphere. Thought you ought to hear it. We've got Dr. Nick Begich here tonight. And uh, that is weird, isn't it? And we're, uh, we're about to turn him over to you. That's, that's a classic one right there. You're hearing harp. Listen carefully. Uh, doctor, those are strange sounds, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, you know, actually, uh, in one experiment, they played Wagner, you know, got the atmosphere to sing Vog Wagner. Did they really? Yeah, this was done actually... Um, through uh, the transmitter in uh, Norway, and it was reported on BBC TV when they did their story on 
these uh, instruments and, and we're disclosing sort of what's going on, you know, globally in this area. They came to Alaska and did some filming and actually traveled uh, literally around the world. Okay, uh, let me, uh, for your sake, kind enough to come on here and tell us about all of this. Um, how do people order, if they wish to, uh, your DVDs, uh, for example, on Mind Control? Sure. Uh, we have um, a toll-free I can uh, give out and a website. The toll-free is uh, 888-690-1277. Again, that's 888-690-1277. One two seven seven, and then the website is earthpulse uh, dot com e a r t h p u l s c, and we're linked uh, to coast to coast AM tonight, so people can go and check that out. And gives you a lot of information on our DVDs and books and publications, as well as our uh, lectures that we have scheduled already this year, um, getting scheduled up for next year. So, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff there, and a lot of information there actually on some of the topics we're covering tonight. And uh, when you do lecture. Uh... Yeah. on harp um, what generally uh, is the reaction of the audience I'm sure you have people coming up to you after the lecture and talking to you oh yeah uh, you know we've lectured in 22 countries um, I've worked in uh, a lot of different venues and you know in the course of that we've met a lot of pretty interesting folks uh, uh, both in and out of the sciences and, and I think that's been uh, perhaps some of the best best of this you know in our work in the European Parliament I was approached by uh, the technology advisor to Santer at the time, and was was assured that they would look into this, you know, this whole issue and would report on it. And actually, what they did is did a comprehensive report on energy generally in terms of its effects on health and environment, um, and really began to look at this whole area. and And then did quite a bit more uh, in the area of non lethal weapons um, and creating policy standards there for NATO Europe, as well as a number of other areas where the, where initiatives were taken. You know, partially from the information we provided and the networks we were able to connect with uh, in Europe. So lectures have been extremely valuable uh, in getting this story out. All know. right. Here here come uh, some comments from my audience or okay, questions. Great. First time caller line, your turn with Dr. Nick Begich. Hi. Hello. First time caller line. Hello. Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Begich, uh, it seems to me that you rarely mention the woodpecker grid system that the Soviet Union developed. It right. went online in 1976. He mentioned it earlier tonight. Only at your, only when you had to pull it out of him. But the, no, the I European didn't. Union wants to bring down HARP. All of these countries want to bring down HARP. But they're, I think HARP is the only thing that stands between the, uh, the destruction of the United States and, uh, and, and countering HARP and countering woodpecker grid. Yeah, well, you know, the, the woodpecker we actually did mention even in the first publication of Angels Don't Play This Harp as the analogy, because the Russians were actually making overtures to the United States in the early 90s to jointly work on this exact kind of initiative using phased arrays for missile defense applications and, and other applications. And we rejected it at the time. And, and the reason we did is we were already advancing our own systems in that area. And, and, the, and really, the Russians' overture was made for the lack of resources, I would guess, more than anything else and an interest in collaboration for other reasons. But, yeah, absolutely, the Russians were sort of the leaders in the beginning of a lot of this. And even when you talk about energy systems targeting human beings, you know, the microwave beaming of the U.S. Embassy is the classic example sure. of, of that kind of activity. Um, you know, what, what do you think would have happened uh, had, I think it was Malaysia, taken the Russians up on their offer to create a cyclone? Do you, uh, what do you think would have happened? Well, I, th I think there were probably a lot of people shuffling around at that moment, you know. Um, I, you know, I, I think it may have created some problems. I mean, because if they'd actually pulled it off and demonstrated that publicly, you know, that opens up a whole lot of discussion that perhaps some folks would rather not have right now. And I would think. And when you see, you know, the last three sector of defense alluding to this sort of reopening of the treaty and abandoning it, uh, you know, it, it speaks volumes for where we're headed. And I think... When you look at even the, the published materials, and there's not been a lot, but there's been some, uh, the U.S. Army's uh, publication, you know, potential weather modification capabilities was an Air Force uh, 2025 document. And, you know, they talk about, you know, all the kinds of things we've been talking about tonight, um, and all of those are prohibited under an international treaty today. Well, I just can't imagine anybody saying anything about it, Doctor. I'll tell you something. As a ham operator, yeah. uh, it's well known that if you move into a neighborhood and you put an antenna or a tower up, everybody in the neighborhood uh, who has any little flicker or disturbance on their television or 
their toast is overdone. It's <laughs> all the fault of that tower. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the analogy, I mean, if you yeah. look at HARP, if they were to actually announce that they're able to affect weather in one way or the other, anything that went wrong, including a lot of things these days, right? Yeah. As you look and, at your television, they'd all be blamed on HARP. Absolutely. And that's, and that's kind of, you know, when I said earlier, it's sort of a metaphor because, you know, it happens every time there's a... A uh, tsunami, an earthquake, anything, you know, now, you know, people want to want to blame this one system. And yet there are many technologies that have been spoken about in the open literature that could create the same kinds of effects. It's really, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's maybe simpler than we imagine. When you, you know, I have, uh, we were talking about Tesla in one of the earlier programs, and I have all of his published papers in, uh, in, in English. And when you read them and you start to think about what, what that was all about and what's really going on is it was all about energy, oscillating energy fields and manipulating them for very specific effects. And I, I, I've got a question for you. Uh, I'm really, really interested in Tesla, of course. And I guess I would like your view. If you've done all of that reading, Doctor, was Tesla, um, was he a mad scientist? No, not at I, I all. I mean, obviously, he was brilliant. Oh, yeah, I, absolutely. But, yeah. you know, everyone who's brilliant that I've ever met is a little quirky, too. So yes. he wasn't exempt from that. <laughs> so perhaps a little quirky, but uh, right on the money, you think, with... Oh, yeah. I think his, um, his capacity for invention was pretty unique. He could actually envision a design and testing of an apparatus and then built the first time every time. And well, if you time. separate... Uh, Tesla myth from reality. Yeah. Um, if that's even possible, uh, did he, do you think he created earthquakes? Do you think he shook buildings? Do you think he did some of the wilder things that are attributed to him? Yeah, I, actually I do, because it's really what, he's, what he was doing is uh, finding those um, points of instability that you could trigger using resonance as a, as a basic uh, ingredient in his whole thinking, and it was oscillating fields. A coherent energy fields that he was able to manipulate and control for various effects. And I think it's as simple as that. That's why you start seeing these references in the open literature, because it is probably quite simple, and it's as simple as dialing the right station. And, you know, what, what in literally that way, and I think it's a matter of understanding energy and those relationships between uh, the things you're trying to affect. And when you look at oscillating energy fields and stuff at Tesla, which all of his work was about that, there's something else that shows up as these violations of the so-called you know, rules of physics in terms of speed of light, and he gets these effects that sort of violate the rule. And what I think he was manipulating were secondary effects, scalar effects that were much more profound, and he understood that. Well, here's something I'd like to know. When he died, they, the government rushed in and confiscated right. all of his papers. We all know that. Right. Right. Um, since they did that, uh, you would think that if they were relatively harmless or crackpot theories or, I don't know, whatever, they'd be made public. Now, what's, what's become of all this stuff that we ran in and secretly grabbed up? Well, some of it went actually was, strangely enough, ended up back in Yugoslavia. I don't know exactly what the mechanism was there, but then the bulk of it was just gone. I mean, it's out of circulation. Gone. But, but when you look at what was published in um, English and German, it fills several volumes. His patent record is pretty substantial. And when you start to look at that, and if you read it, sort of take a look at all of it and then start thinking about it in, in consideration of, of the fields of science he was interested in, you see a more complete picture of what he was about. And what he was really about was, in fact, manipulating energy fields in very precise ways with the understanding that underlying all physical matter was energy in and of itself. And so, well, what do you think we did with all of these papers? Did we shred them, burn them, lose them? <laughs> oh, no, now, I now think the we, Roswell things, we, we lost all those records, right? Right. Uh, you know, I think a lot of this, you know, what you see in the open literature is like the grain of sand on the beach of information. And, you know, we, we, we do a fairly good job of rooting out the documents that are public. And, uh, you know, I think there's probably a lot to be said for where military science is today, and it's probably much further along than most of us imagine. And the, the advantages that show up when you start talking about weather modification is the advantages of waging covert wars, and the advantage of that in, in terms of, um, of, of governments is, is, is huge in terms of what, what one government might consider uh, All right. Well, again, we've done a bad job this year because yeah, it, yeah, it, I mean, sure. it's going to affect our gross national product. It's been so bad. Wildcard line, you're on the air with Dr. Nick Begich. Hi. 
good evening, Art and Dr. Baggage. This is Blair in Sedona, Arizona. Yes, sir. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm great. Hey, I have a question and a follow-up if time allows. Okay. Oh, by the way, one possible solution, you know, for those intent on living in hurricane zones, earlier this month I house sat for one week in a solar and wind-powered 2,000-cubic-foot masonry dome, structurally oh, yeah. sound, for 140 to 150 mile per hour yeah. sustained winds, right, They're Nick? Very nice. Oh, okay. Yeah, but anyway, as to harp agitating the ionosphere, you know, no safeguards. Uh, Nick, you said compartmentalization exists within bureaucracies. Bureaucracies have foremost interest. Yeah. It appears to service and keep maintaining themselves. Do you have any ideas about policies and organizational uh, structures that can accommodate and, let's say, interact with a new social structure that will simultaneously protect our rights? Yeah, you know, this is a good question. You know, Tom Spencer, while he was still in the European Parliament, was going to pursue this, and we had done a paper that suggested that there needs to be extensions of whistleblower mechanisms for both the private sector and government, where when you're developing technologies that work against uh, human interests, that there ought to be a way... Uh, to have an, uh, an impartial ombudsman type uh, structure so that you could address some of these things and do it in a way that doesn't damage people's career forever. You know, I mean, the threat of people working in these programs is disclosure is huh. you're done. Yes. <laughs> and so you really have to balance that national interest against the public's right to know, and I think we need to create institutions at this time that can address that. Yeah. And you mentioned the uh, drug war, terrorism, yeah. and all of those, those fear-based things that got us right. into this situation. Well, here's a simplistic answer, and of course I'd like you to comment on that. How about legalizing drugs, reducing fear through a more equitable distribution of resources? <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I think of it, you know, if you call it a war on drugs, it's been a pretty big failure. But, you know, the fact of the matter is what shows up is this discussion of, you know, fear. And, you know, these things that have happened with terrorism in the country are pretty phenomenal, but when you look at their impact on the general attitude of people in terms of what they're willing to tolerate, it's, it's dramatic. And I think that's, you know, when, when, when that level of freedom is, uh, is at stake and technology is advanced to the point where a lot more can happen now than ever before in terms of how technologies are used, for a, a more directed and controlled society, if you will. And, and that's where we're at. I mean, whether it's gathering information or what the European Parliament refers to as data valence, uh, methods of using information to really make sweeping conclusions about individuals and populations. And there's ways of manipulating then now data and information and feeding it back to people in pretty dramatic ways. Um, you know, the, when we talked about uh, this thing in uh, uh, Iraq and the first Gulf War about being able to embed a signal on radio broadcasts, that's been used commercially in Japan for dissuading shoplifters in department stores. But think about those technologies applied to political races. Or oh, I, I heard it was actually being used here as well. Yeah, you know, so, you know, when you start thinking about uh, this is like the most profound uh, technology uh, device. When you look at a publication by the U.S. Army War College. Uh, it was called an article called "The Mind No Has, has No Firewalls." Back in ninety, I believe it was ninety-eight. The mind has no firewalls. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was a reprint of an earlier article by a military journal in, the, in Russia called Orienteer, and it talked about being able to utilize all kinds of methods. In fact, I'll read the one-liner uh, out of this. It kind of summarizes or summarizes what's here, and it says. A psychotronic generator which produces a powerful electromagnetic emanation capable of being sent through telephone lines, TV, radio network supply pipes, uh, and incandescent lamps. The signal would manipulate the behavior of those in contact with the signal, unquote. In other words, just using those things to carry a signal in, you can manipulate anyone in close proximity to those energy sources. Gotcha. Here comes a quick one, maybe. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Begich. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name's Steve, and I'm from Missouri. Yes, sir. Um, back in 82, um, I had the privilege to uh, repair electronic gear at White Sands Missile Base. Ah. And I was, as I was pulling in, I noticed, why in the heck would they need all those towers? Well, I left that company and ended up moving back to, to uh, Missouri. Towers? What do you mean? Radio towers? What, radio towers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, Ray you know, of towers that look like there's going to be antennas mounted on Oh, you mean similar to perhaps HARP? Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Um, and uh, 
So I didn't think any more about it, and years went by and years went by. Uh, relocated back to Missouri, and I'm going out to Scott Air Force Base, uh, which is on the uh, Illinois side. And uh, as I'm going through Muscoot, Illinois, there towards the base, I look to my right, and what do I see? I see towers everywhere with an antenna array. And I'm thinking, those are some strange antennas. Look, some are a little different. So um, I went onto the base and repaired the gear, and, and uh, I was asking a gentleman, what is that? He says, oh, well, they're, they're, they're doing some scientific uh, testing. Uh-huh. Well, uh, within three or four months, um, I was viewing television. I don't know what channel it was. Either it was a Discovery or... And there's a guy that comes on, and he says, yeah, there's these, these arrays that they're building, what they're doing is they're going to punch holes in the ionosphere so they can... Uh, no kidding. ...launch magnetically... It, now, let me get this straight. It's, it's on an Air Force base in Missouri? Once again, the man who really started asking all the hard questions about harp. He is that man, Dr. Nick Begich. And um, I'm curious, Dr. Begich, what, you know, going back to when you began to speak out about all of this, right. what triggered it? Do you, re- do you recall? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a, a short article I read in an um, uh, Australian publication. It was about five column inches talking about this facility in Alaska. And, and quite frankly, uh, it was making you know these same, same claims of being able to affect weather systems and uh, being able to affect uh, um, uh, generation of ELF waves for earth penetrating tomography and so on. I didn't believe it. You know? So I, you know, I'm kind of a curious person. And you know, Alaska's maybe a big uh, geographic area, but a small population. I hadn't heard anything about this project in our local media. So as I began to inquire and start to look at the environmental impact statements and then the um, military's pronouncements and then some of the technical memorandum on the project and start sending it to engineers and researchers who were encouraging me to go ahead and write uh, on the subject. And we published a, an article um, first in Nexus, of all places, and then... Uh, that led to meeting Gene Manning, who was following the same issue in a number of events where we wrote, uh, Angels Don't Play This Harp, and that began the whole uh, exercise on this technology. And then, really, my interest in electrophysiology, the effect of electromagnetic fields on the human body, is what really struck me uh, with harp initially. And then, when you started looking at sort of what else was going on in the sciences in this area, that, that became pretty... Uh, disconcerting and, and 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 really led to feeling like that was maybe a good place to spend some time as a researcher, really educating the public, being that sort of translator of complicated science by working with a lot of specialists in a number of fields. Well, it seems to me though that after all you've done, I mean, if you were to, uh, for example, get to the facility, they wouldn't exactly roll out the red carpet and start the marching <laughs> band for your arrival. No. No, in fact, um, you know, there was a lot of problems along the way, you know, as, re- as it relates to some of this. And, uh, you know, Tom Spencer, who chaired Foreign Affairs, you know, he was asked to, you know, not put these sections in. And the State Department had pressured him and committee members to, you know, with- withhold their support for it. And, you know, and it didn't happen. Three days after the resolution passed, Tom Spencer's political career ended in a scandal in Great Britain that, you know, if not the most coincidental thing in the world, <laughs> just the way it all un- unraveled. All right, a lot of people want to say something. So, sure, for, let's go. For first time caller line, uh, you're on the air with Dr. Bigage. Hello. Yeah, good, mor- good morning, Art. Good, good morning, morning, Nick. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to know, uh, Art, you, were, you asked him a question earlier about uh, other governments and other, uh, other countries having yes. involvement with the HARP program. Yes. And if, if we remember correctly, uh, when we first sent our U.S. troops over to Iraq, there was that huge dust storm that uh, kind of hindered them for, uh, caused a lot of problems. Ah, you, I recall, yes. Right, right. Yeah, right. I so did they cause can... that dust storm? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, if, if there was any involvement. All right, Doctor, there. how about it? Well, I, you know, I don't know that they did, but, you know, this is, again, the kind of technology we're talking about. You know, can you create these effects? And the answer is yes, according to what's shown up in uh, public literature. The fact that... So you're saying could have been. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's where, you know, that's where this stuff gets really tough because, 
without international monitoring, which means a certain level of sophistication on the part of those that are making those observations, you've got to know what to look for, uh, you know, that's where it really needs to start. And, you know, some of the some of this technology, you know, when you think about it, the idea of transferring the, the way technology works is we're very, very dependent on almost every kind of technological thing that affects our lives in the West and our vulnerability to systems that, that use that as a vehicle um, for weapons applications is pretty in amazing. Boy, you keep uh, weapons comes up a lot. Uh, languishing east of the Rockies was that caller. I'm sorry I left you on, on hold there too long uh, in Missouri. No it was talking about... The antennas in Missouri, right, caller? And Illinois? Yes. Illinois, yeah. Illinois. And, and, and so he's suggesting that there's more to heart than just Alaska. Yeah, I would agree. And, and, you do. Uh, Rosalie Bertel reported on a Canadian system of arrays. Rosalie was, um, a physis is a physicist and was a, 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 the lead physician. She's also an MD in Bhopal for the World Health Organization after that disaster. Very prominent person. She testified with us in the... European Parliament uh, on these types of weapon systems. The European system, the EasyCat system, exists and is acknowledged. All right, caller. So the answer to the question is yes, uh, there could be associated yeah. systems. And that, maybe that was one of them. You never know. Could be. Right. What, what about the uh, launching of, of uh, they're, not, they're blowing holes in the atmosphere to launch magnetically induced catapult spaceships? through the ionosphere so that their fuel can be used to go on to Mars. All right, well, I don't know about that. Know about that. Uh, you know, what I can say is one of the earlier ideas was of being able to take uh, energy in the ra in form of radio frequency and by focusing it the way they can transfer it extremely efficiently for energizing low-orbiting space platforms, which change, you know, a whole bunch in terms of dimensions of warfare. If you can maintain low orbits, which require larger amounts of energy, but if you can do it efficiently with these kinds of transmitters, you really could change. You move space platforms into, literally, uh, warfare platforms into space. You change the dimension of warfare. Now, I haven't been exactly counting the number of times you've said warfare and weapons, but yeah. it's been a lot. Well, you know, so, it's really uh, the essence of HARP. I mean, uh, it's <laughs> HARP's deal, the and essence of that's what they're interested in. The applications as they apply to weapons applications is what military research is all about. They don't, they don't do it for the good of mankind. Well, uh, back when you and I began these interviews, there was some more of that good of mankind stuff in there than there was weapons and military. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's some, some interesting applications with HARP, and unfortunately in the 11 years that we followed this project, none of those are really being explored. And those are the ones that deal with perhaps mitigating some of the big issues of the day. You know, if ozone depletion is really a problem, uh, Ben Eastland's concepts in terms of generating ozone using these systems becomes pretty interesting. You betcha. And, and, I, and, so, and I just can't believe they haven't asked. Uh, military leaders would have to ask with what's going on in our world right now. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Bigot. Yes, Art. This is Chuck in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, way up in Fairbanks. Yeah, right next door. And I had talked to you several years ago, Art, and you'd actually had my picture on your website. I'm the guy that buys and sells mammoth tusks and ivory. Of course. Yeah, and we, you know, I buy from the remote Eskimo villages, and a lot of them are just literally washing away, and we're finding quite a few tusks this year. Uh, but I wanted to ask uh, Nick about uh, two questions, and one is about uh, Poker Flat, which is right. right over the hill from us. It's kind of a top-secret site that uh, was supposedly just researched with the university. Right. And, uh, and I have another question, but can you answer that one well, first? Well, yeah, what about... Flats is um, a federally funded uh, rocket range. Uh, it, it's been funded to probably in excess of $100 million over the years, maybe quite a bit more than that now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's used, it also has uh, a small phased array that's used as high pass. It's used in conjunction with HARP for some of its applications. And, you know, quite a bit of atmospheric climate uh, research takes place at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and through the Geophysical Institute, as well as... Uh, now a fair amount of military research. Okay. And also, my, my next question is, is two years ago we had one of the strongest earthquakes in 40-some years, right. and it was located that uh, the fault line, the epicenter, was not far from the Harper Ray right. in, in the Copper River Valley. Is right. that just a coincidence? And if... And why would they locate Harp in an area that was so prone to earthquakes? I know there hadn't been any there uh, a long, for a long time before. Well, there's a reason why they put Harp where it is, right, Doctor? Yeah, there's several, actually. And, and, and seismic stability, 
wasn't really so much of an issue. So why did they put it there? It was a location in proximity to the magnetic field lines. The further north you go, uh, the, the easier it is to move energy into those magnetic field lines because they intersect the Earth at the poles. So ideally you want to be uh, close to large energy sources, natural gas ideally, that you can then convert eventually to electrical power and then you know, fire up a pretty good-sized array. So, and so you want to fire this at a location where you can have the most effect, and right. that's along those magnetic lines. Right, and, and so ultimately you, you'll see these appear in the furthest northern regions uh, where, where there's gas supplies. In Alaska, that happens to be the northern, north slope of Alaska. So you expect to see that eventually developed as, as these technologies get proven out with this, what they call a developmental prototype, the first array that they've constructed. Okay. All right. Uh, International Line, you're on the air with Dr. Begich. Hi. Hey, Art. How you doing? Hey, Dr. Begich. How are you? Good. Thank you. It's Wayne calling from the, uh, South Carolina currently. Yes, sir. Um, I guess it, the question I have is sort of like a building question. Um, our, our Earth is protected by a magnetic field, correct? Yes. Okay, that magnetic field is generated by the molten middle of the planet? Well, it's, it's by a complex to a number of, of interactions. It's both the solar activity affecting magnetic field lines, which are by the rotation of the planet, and the whole dynamic it creates those magnetic field lines, like a big uh, magnet would uh, in, in a science experiment from high school. You get those same kind of magnetic field lines. All right, uh, stay close to the phone for me. I think we lost that last caller. First time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Nick Begich. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you doing today? Fine. What is your first name? My first name is Scott, and I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Florida, okay. Yes. I'm calling to see about, I grew up in a home where, you know, the media pretty much was a source of information. And then in the 90s, I learned about Operation Harp and nanotechnology. And I was just curious about the, um, as far as the surface, I feel, you know, I was wondering how accurate and informed we are with the news media and what there might be as far as if they're good to uh, use as a source or if they're reliable. Hmm. How reliable is media on this subject, you mean? Um, I, I would say just, I'm trying to think of the best way to state the question is the reliability of our media uh -huh. based on uh, unknowns that we are learning about. Well, uh, you know, part of it, you know, I think what you're driving at is this idea of, you know, a lot of the reporting that's done today is not really investigative reporting. It's really just press release. Uh, Most of it, doctor. Uh, posting, it. yeah. And so... When you're talking about complex science issues, it even becomes more difficult. And really, when you think about it, they're the most important issues that we face today because what makes governments powerful in the world today is the technologies they command. So, you know, we need to have at least some kind of a conceptual knowledge. We don't have to know how to build this stuff any more than we, most of us anyway. Or, or, or what can make them weak is what they don't command, as is being constantly demonstrated to us by our apparent, apparent inability to control the course of a hurricane. I mean, you don't, you don't want to think that we're controlling and making this no. happen. No, no, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, I've heard those kind of assertions being made, and, you know, people are commenting in that way, and I don't think that's constructive unless you can really demonstrate. And you know how particular I have been over the years with, with documents. You know, that's kind of, of the, course. My, my method of the proof is in the paper, <laughs> you know. And, you know, a lot of researchers use word-of-mouth testimony or you know, that kind of, uh, or, or theorizing on their own, and I don't do that. And I think it's dangerous to do it. The technologies we can demonstrate through the literature existing and being advanced and then the ethical questions that surround it are the ones that at least we've tried to stimulate and in some cases been, you know, more successful than others. And I think ultimately... Uh, you know, the, the technology shouldn't be so scary, you know. I mean, we drive our cars every day, yet we can't work on them, you know. It's only it's scary the because we don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> right. Wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Bigot. Hello. Yeah, our 73 is Paul out in uh, Vancouver, Washington. Yes. I'm a certified EPA microbiologist, chemist. Uh, I shouldn't say microbiologist because that's hunting season, those guys. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my question is, why is the signature, I'm like Art, I'm a 73 guy, uh, ham radio operator, I put a microphone on my sonicator one on, and it has a 83% exact same signature as your harp and burst. And those bursts kill bacteria and disrupt cells. And why are they doing that? 
All right. Well, first of all, I don't know if we know that's true, that these kind of signals, when they return to Earth, have some effect on uh, at the bacteria. Maybe they do. Well, here's the thing. is This is where um, whether they're deliberately affecting another system by operating in one regime to accomplish one thing, and this is where those... We were talking about window frequencies, you know, in the ELF range, which is used for Earth-penetrating tomography. This happens to be places uh, within uh, the frequency ranges that are also biologically active uh, in the course of humans. But when you start to look at all of the electromagnetic interactions that surround us today that man's created, and then start to think about it, I mean, we have 200 million times more radio frequency energy around us today than nature uh, produced. Like a giant soup, Doctor. Yeah, exactly. So... You know, the, from that, most of it's just like the static between the stations. But occasionally we develop systems that uh, sort of trip over ourselves. We don't even see ourselves doing it. And I think that's the stage of development that we're in, is you see a lot of literature emerging very rapidly uh, talking about electromagnetic field effects on living organisms. Still highly debated, but nonetheless, you cannot argue with the amount of literature that's been produced in the scientific community showing those effects. And... The military is uh, seeking those effects for applications in terms of weapon systems. And when you look world. at the whole array, here's the science of the day that could perhaps uh, enhance human performance to unprecedented levels. Save the day or ruin it. Uh, yeah. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Begich. Not a lot of time. Hi. Uh, that's right. Uh, Dr. Begich, uh, you used the domino uh, effect analogy earlier in the program. Uh, I'd like you to apply uh, that principle to fundraising and let us know the next time you come on this program how we can start sending money to you in $30 contributions a month, how we can get wills made out for the benefit of a foundation that will advance what you're doing, and let's not beat around the bush anymore. Let's get down to business and get something done. All right. Yeah. Well, there, there's somebody who wants action. Absolutely. And, you know, that's part of what uh, the Lay Foundation is being established to accomplish, and it's been put together by one of the heirs of Herman Lay, who was um, uh, the founder of uh, Lay Potato Chips that merged with Frito and PepsiCo. So oh. she is actually... Uh, created, uh, Dorothy Lay uh, has created a foundation, I'm their executive director and a member of the board, to do exactly that, to make sure that we can get this information out. One of the things we'll be doing is putting together a website with our entire research bibliography eventually loaded into it uh, and making that available to researchers, politicians, and media where it might be more useful than sitting in our, you know, in our, our library just gathering dust. Excellent, so, Doctor. Listen, we're out of time. Okay, uh, we'll the, do the this number again. To, the number to order the DVD, of course we'll do it again. number to order the DVD is 888-690-1277. Mind Control, that's what it's about. 888-690-1277. Correct, Doctor? That's it. All yeah. right, buddy, listen, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for uh, having me, and I'll get hold of uh, Dr. Eason. We'll see if we can do it again and maybe have a really interesting... Looking forward to it. Take care. Dr. Nick Begich, don't forget, if you've got a good ghost-to-ghost -ghost story, write a little synopsis, put your phone number at the bottom, and we'll call you. A live ghost-to-ghost -ghost coming up October 31st.